But uh, anyway, thanks a lot for uh, for all the nice things you said. Um, yeah, you know, one of the funny things is that Max was actually one of the very first people that I met going to uh, College for Creative Studies. Max had a Corvair, and uh, I used to have to bum rides with him all the time. And so as a result, he became one of my best friends because <laughs> where we went to school, it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. It, not in the middle of nowhere, but it was kind of a very burnout area. And uh, I came from the country, uh, grew up in a place called Paw Paw, Michigan, which was kind of strange. I didn't want anybody to know that I grew up in the country. So I think I, I tried to make myself as sleek and as polished as possible, you know, going through college. But when I first arrived, I used to wear uh, Caterpillar boots and flannel. And Max was from, I, I think you were from El, El, Elwood. Is that what it was? Uh, Indiana. And so we kind of, uh, I, I think instantly. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of gelled. But anyway, uh, definitely trip down memory lane. Um, one of the things that hasn't changed, though, is the fact that he's a, he's a great guy. And I have, uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it's such a great opportunity to be able to um, uh, present to you all today. So yeah, so designed to, to disrupt. And I picked this topic, um, one, because it was late and I was about to go to sleep. And I was like, oh, shoot, I got to text Max something. So it was something that came to me just before I went to sleep. But, you know, I ended up, um, you know, really thinking about it. It actually was a perfect uh, topic because as designers, um, you know, our, our job is um, not to disrupt in the sense to make, you know, things annoying, but to disrupt sort of norms and look for better ways to um, uh, design products, experiences, spaces, and I feel like that's an appropriate thing. Um, when, when, when people disrupt a lot of thing, times you think of the, the class clown, the person in the back of the class making noise or throwing airplanes or, you know, doing something crazy like that. But in reality, what we're doing is we're disrupting sort of, like I said, the norms and the way that people do things and questioning why do they have to be that way? Is there a better way? And we want people to end up with um, feeling like they're, they're um, uh, whatever experience it is that we're creating is better. And, and we want them to question why they even did it the other way at all. That's kind of like my goal. So anyway, um, when we look at my current job, I work for um, Harmon. Um, Harmon, you guys, I don't know if you all know it, but um, we make products from JBL. So if anybody has a like portable JBL boom box or party box or flip or clip or any of our headphones or all that stuff, that's part of our product lines or one of our product lines, one of our brands. Another brand is Infinity. We own Harmon Carden. We do automotive for Bang & Olsen, Bowers & Wilkins. So we do a, a number of different uh, brands that all have their you know, heritage and sort of very, very renowned in, in terms of audio. So it's a pleasure again to be here. So let's go through quickly what I'll be covering. I'll cover one, introduce you to our organization, which is Human. And probably a lot of you guys have heard of like BMW Design Works or Porsche Design. Human is similar to that where we, are, we're, uh, we started as an internal agency, uh, or we actually we started as an internal design organization. And uh, um, what happened is we had won so many awards and we've been doing so much great work um, that they decided to also allow us to be able to be formed into an organization that is internal and external. So the cool thing about that is that we are um, sort of, Harmon is our number one or kind of like one of our major clients. And so we are the agency of record for Harmon. But then as a result, we work with all these other companies. Um, you know, so anyway. Um, about me, uh, like Max said, I'm a CCS graduate. Um, my focus was on transportation design. And when I, I think pretty much every, ever since I could remember, my goal was to design cars. And um, I think um, after my first job, I kind of decided that um, it wasn't enough for me and that I wanted to do more. Um, so um, I, I guess, uh, cars was always a dream, but it, I always liken it to like, you know, sort of eating sweets all the time, right? You could eat candy for every meal, but after a while, it just kind of, it doesn't really fill you up. It's, it's, it's exciting and it's, it's, it's very visceral, but at the same time, I felt like for me, at least, I needed to, to solve more problems. So um, I, I attribute that to probably um, growing up on a farm and being able to look at things and, and, and really being able to take time and, and observe things and to try to really um, uh, understand things. And I felt like with, with the um, external exterior design, there wasn't as much for me to think about. Um, 
from that, um, graduating from CCS, um, I ended up um, working for uh, Ford at first, and then Ford had a spinoff called Vistian, so I worked for them. And I was there for quite a long time. And during that time, I actually um, started two companies. So I did one company, it was an iOS case uh, company. We made iPhone cases and accessories. And then the other company was a company that I did um, on kick, with, with Kickstarter um, called iBuku Pets. And that was like probably one of my most fun things that I've ever done. Um, as a designer, I feel like um, you have a, the unique ability to be able to see things, have vision, and then um, sort of put those plans to action in order to build it. So I had no clue about starting a company. I had no clue about like, you know, selling products and retail and SKU numbers and all, all the other stuff that's involved with, with making a product. But as a designer, I feel like we just innately have this ability to um, figure things out and make it work, you know, in a way that I think not many other professions have. Um, so with, with that, um, I um, ended up coming to Harmon one of my business partners actually came to Harmon and um, I ended up deciding that, you know, I, I, I was ready to leave my other job and um, I hit him up and I just told him, I was like, Hey man, I'm thinking about leaving. And he goes, Oh wait, the guy who's the head of design for this group at the time, which was called lighthouse, he's going to be in town. Um, you know, I want you to meet him. And he's like, can you do it on Wednesday? And I'm like thinking, you know, how much I, you know, didn't want to be at my <laughs> current job. So I'm like, I didn't even know if I had meetings on my calendar, but I was just like, sure, let's meet for lunch. And we met for lunch and the rest is history. So currently at Harmon, um, I'm responsible for industrial design for our connected, uh, well, for, number one, I'm, I'm head of design for our aftermarket car and semi OEM business. So I'm responsible for all products from aftermarket car and semi OEM. In addition to that, um, I'm also responsible for um, our connected services business. Um, I do stuff for our connected car business. And then also I am one of the main people that help with our external agency called Human. And Human is probably, if you look at the agency, it's about two years old. Um, and it's actually um, led by a former uh, California State University Long Beach alumni, Christian Schlender, who is our um, executive vice president. So um, very happy to be here. So let me do a really quick intro of human. Um, Max, do, do you, uh, is, is everybody able to hear everything okay? Is my volume okay? Sounds good. Okay, yeah, great. Everything sounds good. Okay, okay, cool. So like I mentioned, human is a strategic design agency whose purpose is to deliver meaningful holistic experiences that give our clients a competitive advantage. In other words, we could create experiences with heart. And when we say heart, we mean, you know, it's, it's with love, the way that we create them, but it's also uh, experiences that mean something, experiences that have gravitas, that attract people, and they're bold, right? And so that's kind of what we strive to do every day uh, for every one of our brands and every one of our clients. Um, we work across uh, multiple disciplines around the globe. We've got 250 designers in six locations. And as far as humans history goes, um, the, the history of, of the design organization at Harman in total is around nine years. And currently we focus on industrial design, UI, UX, and communication design. Um, we have also another division called FX Future Experience, which is um, some of the stuff I'll be sharing with you tonight. Um, this kind of goes through sort of what we do to um, help our clients define and deliver the future. Um, so we, we start with sort of an idea and we can take them through delivery. And the beauty of human compared to a lot of different design agencies is that we're not just design, we're designed all the way through marketing and production. So we can do the full gamut of um, helping a product, you know, kind of helping people to realize and find the white space of where the product should be. And then all the way through, you know, the end of, you know, shooting commercials and producing, you know, um, advertising uh, images, you know, for the clients. So it's really, really awesome um, to be a part of an organization that has such range and um, um, it, it's, it's really cool. Um, so the idea behind sort of one of our foundational beliefs is that we believe that technology and design to be create that can, can come together to create something magical. And you can see one of our um, JBL uh, brand ambassadors, uh, Keita Klain, 
and we have one of our JBL party boxes. And this was a very transformational product in terms of the market. I think we went from not even existing in the market through within two years owning the entire market. You know, we are larger than Sony in this space now. Um, and our approach involves research, exploration through design, and a real focus on the user. So what human delivers is experiences that are intuitive, immersive, and meaningful. And I'm going to just kind of go through these a little quicker, quicker so I can get into sort of the meat of the presentation. Um, if you look at where we range in terms of like our sweet spots, we focus a lot on mobility, um, which is like cars, trains, planes, automobiles, not like the movie, um, consumer products, and a wide range of those, and then digital services. Um, and then this shows you all of our capabilities. Um, and then this kind of quickly goes through sort of how we create experiences from aligning and defining the beginning through research, design, uh, development, and testing, and then finally a launch. Um, so if you look at our clients, we have a number of clients, and this is just like a small sort of <laughs> preview of our clients. Um, you know, companies like Lamborghini, Maserati, Jeep, Bentley, Lexus, Under Armour, McLaren, Bang & Olufsen. These are all clients and people that we, we work with to help to deliver amazing experiences. Um, and they partner with us because we, we've won a lot of awards. In fact, I was just uh, uh, alerted yesterday that we had won another 20 awards for an upcoming awards ceremony, which I was just like, you know, really impressed with. So it, the, the award count is even higher than this. We're probably closer to 350 or 400, you know, probably this year. Uh, our work, um, this is going to show you kind of a, a video that kind of is going to give you an idea of some of our work. So um, let me play that. Okay, I couldn't drop the mic, but we dropped the flag. Anyways, um, this is kind of gonna give you a little bit of a preview of some of the work that we've done. This was a, um, a, a show vehicle that we did for CES a couple of years ago, um, elevating the in-car um, uh, mobile experience. And what we ended up doing was redesigning the whole Fiat 500E. So we actually took an existing vehicle, ripped it apart, did sketches, and then refabricated a whole new interior and created like this whole new theme uh, called a coastal highway cruiser. And the idea was the car essentially became a portable electronic device. So you bring it to the beach, you could actually play music from the car. It has speakers in the front, but then the, that, that was the fun part. But in terms of practicality, um, we were using the technology as like ADAS or like pedestrian awareness. Um, to be able to alert people that the vehicle was coming so it would make a, you know, like sounds and it was all electric vehicle. So we ended up um, removing the, the rear seats and we created this sort of Barquetta. It's a really fun project to kind of create sort of this theme and show the art of the possible. And we got really good um, sort of uh, feedback from members of, you know, the car community and um, even the CEO from um, FCA. So, or not CEO, uh, head of design, Ralph Shield. Um, this is another project called UMA, which I'll share with you. 
which we recently were recognized in 2020 from FASCO uh, for a world changing idea. So um, the idea behind UMA was the exploration between people and transportation and showing how technology can help to bring together a more beautiful and more harmonious future in terms of autonomy. Um, uh, digital experience for Mazda. So again, like we don't just design products, we design experiences. So helping Mazda um, to be able to make more sense uh, and, and, and may be able to land um, um, you know, customers, you know, with, with customers, uh, helping to give them a more complete car buying experience. Um, so yeah, there's a number of things, but um, I'm going to fast forward through these so that we can get into the actual presentation. Um, so so it, I, I guess when we, we gave the presentation, it said that the uh, pen is mightier than the sword. And I thought I made this up, but apparently this guy, Edward Bulwer Lytton in England, circa 1839 made this up, or he, he said this. And it, it's, it's quite appropriate, I guess, in, in terms of, um, you know, the pen definitely, you know, the writings, you know, the words that people, you know, put down, they can be uh, of greater sort of weaponry than, than actual physical warfare. But I guess in design, the digital pen is the new sword. So I just made that one up. So I don't have to feel bad about it. But uh, <laughs> um, anyway, good design resonates globally from Berlin to Moscow, Seoul to Los Angeles, and even London to Mumbai. In a world where change is constant and leapfrog technology is the norm, attractive styling has now become the table stake as uh, experience has become a new brand differentiator. What will the future hold? So what I'll do is I'm gonna take you through a project called UMA. And um, UMA is this uh, project that we had that uh, my team, um, a number of other teams around the globe, we were posed with the question of what was the future of, what will the future of mobility hold? What will autonomous cars be like? And we first started focusing on all the cars and just the vehicle themselves. And it ended up translating into something much more different and looking at the overall experience and thinking about how the vehicle could naturally be able to fit into your lifestyle and not just the vehicle in a singular term, but mobility, I guess, you know, movement, you know, getting from place A to place B. And I travel a lot normally when there's not COVID. So I spend a lot of time, you know, in China and in Europe and different places. And one of the things that I did notice or I have noticed is, you know, we're very car centric, a very car um, focused culture, but um, like when I'm in New York or when I'm in some of these other countries, especially like China, you know, I never drive and I'm always, you know, you know, there's a ride share somewhere or there's some sort of mode of transportation that can get me from place A to place B. But the problem, the thing that's missing is it's all the integration, integrating all those things together to make it seamlessly um, sort of happen. So I noticed that sometimes I'm fumbling to try to figure out a train schedule and then I'm like, okay, now I need to switch to uh, Uber or a Lyft to, to, to get me to the building and then I need to hop on a scooter and then it's raining. So now I got to, you know, figure out something else. So, you know, how, how do we, you know, eliminate all those problems? And my team, what we've done in, with, with, along with this project is we've, um, you know, become you know good at design thinking, good at writing out down our ideas, and then what I'm going to show you is like helping to communicate them. So we're not like you know my team, we're not animators, we're not like you know uh, you know storytellers, I, I guess by trade, but the objective is to tell the story and help to paint the picture of this what we call UX storytelling to help us to be able to set up goalposts to figure out where um, the opportunities are in the future. So. Without further ado, welcome to the bright autonomous future. So this is a story about the harmonious relationship between humans and urban transportation technologies par powered by artificial intelligence. It's a mouthful. So our version, or our vision, <laughs> welcome to the bright future where cities are growing rapidly and urban environments are becoming hugely attractive for people to live. This is a future, uh, a new thoughtful approach to urban planning enabled by a harmonious relationship between public, private, and natural environments in a highly dense space. AI-powered vehicles are deeply integrated into the public transportation ecosystem. Compact, autonomous city capsules offer a very personalized experience. And then what we're looking at is, you know, the owning a car culture is, you know, starting to fade already and it will probably continue to fade in these large urban areas. And then even, you know, 
cryptocurrency and subscription-based plans will now become the norm. So with so many people, if you look at a metropolitan area like Los Angeles or New York or uh, you know, any of our major cities, you know, there's, there's thousands or millions of people. And in the world, there are billions of pe people from di different nationalities, ages, different interests. And what we have to do is we have to figure out, you know, how can these solutions, if we create these sort of, you know, they're similar to public transportation, but they're, they're, they're very, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, ubiqu ubiquitous solutions, right, that sort of cover all, all people, you know, how can we personalize them to be able to accommodate these, these different people? Um, so one of the things that we thought of was intelligent things, right? And we know that, um, you know, today, um, you know, AI is, is it, it, it's growing and it's, it's continuing to grow and we think that it will only get better. And so we know that AI will, will be a part of the solution, you know, to this future um, in autonomy. Um, so let's, let's do a little bit more and, and meet UMA. So UMA stands for Urban Mobility Assistant. And like I said, UMA is not just a car. Um, it's an ecosystem, but I, I think the the uh, the poster child for this is is actually the car, and you can see that the um, uh, the vehicle is autonomous, safe, electrified, and connected. Those are kind of our tenets, like our goals. And um, let's look at more how we get there. Um, so one of the things about UMA is it's not like I said, just a single vehicle. UMA is a roadmap um, to mobility, and it starts with the UMA city vehicle. And then um, the city vehicle is sort of looking at like sort of now, but um, in a few years, um, the, the goal is to kind of create this whole ecosystem. We feel that in the future, um, the winners and the losers will be separated by experience. And so whoever puts together the, the most seamless experience will be the winner, right? So it's not even about necessarily styling. I think styling is, is one of those things because styling is a, is a thing that is associated with the brand and there's, it helps to create that visual connection between the, the, the um, user and the, and the product. But I think there's these other things that, that, that will help to, to bring all these things together. So let's really quick look at the, the video of the design and this So I, I guess you could say um, UMA is very expressive, right? And as a vehicle, um, we, we, what we've done is, you know, being a car designer, normally you, you do the expression as sort of the, you know, the, the lines and the curves and everything, but we wanted UMA to be a little bit different. We wanted it to be a little bit more sort of like um, able to connect with humans. And so um, when you look at the expressions, they're very whimsical, but at the same time, um, I, th I think they, they help to overcome sort of the technology barrier of where people are in intimidated by technology and makes it more friendly and makes it more um, acceptable in the urban landscape in terms of uh, communication. And you'll see a little bit more about that here coming up. So we talk about the experience. One of the things that the UMA ecosystem will allow you to do is it will allow you to be able to customize um, 
each vehicle prior to you even getting in the vehicle based on sort of your own preferences, based on sort of uh, your, your current emotional state. And, um, um, it, you know, it all begins at the, the, the UMA hub and um, vehicles, you know, sort of are able to sort of communicate with one another based on what we call unified intelligence, which is like basically V to V or V to X, vehicle to vehicle, a vehicle to infrastructure um, communication. And you might be wondering like how I'm like so much into all this technology. I think another part of what my group does is we work with the technologists, we work with the, the technology teams within the company. So we have like a nice sort of understanding of um, technology and what is state of the art. And um, we're able to kind of get like a little bit, you know, enough to be dangerous, I guess, in terms of <laughs> understanding of the technology. And then um, we're able to um, apply it uh, to sort of these UX um, uh, storytelling to be able to inspire the engineering groups, you know, to, to, to be able to uh, figure out, you know, new ways of doing things. So um, technology is just technology um, when it's applied uh, and when it becomes something real and when it becomes something that's like uh, connects with people on an emotional level, that's when it becomes a necessity. So um, looking at other trends like um, package delivery, um, UMA is uh, take, taking that into account with the ability to be able to um, pick up your packages before it gets to you. So you might have a couple other people in the car, but what it does, it essentially has like a safe within the vehicle. And so if, the vehicle knows that it's going to be picking you up at a certain point, it can automatically pick up your package or hold a package for you until uh, it arrives at your destination, at which time it'll alert you and then you can pick it up before you leave. Um, and th the other idea was if you look at the interior, we wanted to try to make the interior to look more like a home than a car. So blending in with the living spaces and even if you look at the form factor, it's more like a, a, a box. Um, more architectural than uh, vehicle. So um, one of the other things when we talk about architecture is that the visual architecture of UMA, wanted, we wanted it to match uh, even the most modern city um, like uh, Shenzhen or Tokyo, but then be just at home in, just as at home in a European city that's a, like kind of a classical like Renaissance style um, city. So wanted to seamlessly blend in. And this is one of the things I talked about before was building trust um, with its external HMI. Um, one of the other things I forgot to mention is that our parent company now is Samsung. So, um, you know, looking at ways that we can even push the technology, push the display technology to be able to um, use it in new ways. And so this was using uh, display technology or at least proposing it um, so that we could look at, you know, how does the vehicle become uh, a good communicator to people and be uh, able to uh, efficiently and effectively communicate. So um, not just to pedestrians walking across the street, but, you know, how can it communicate better with riders and other pedestrians, um, you know, on, on the road so that uh, it, it, it overall just feels responsible and it creates that uh, sense of trust. Um, one of the things that um, uh, UMA also does is it um, gives people confidence by helping them to be, uh, feel protected and also helping to protect them from other um, drivers who, who might not necessarily notice the vehicle is stopping, but it, you know, giving these additional warnings and using these displays in new ways to be able to you know, communicate and um, you know, create these like seamless experiences. So when you're inside and you're kind of zoned out, you, know, you don't feel the vehicle slamming on the brakes because you know, <laughs> someone ran in front of it or you don't, you don't get, you know, some other surprise. Um, we're also um, utilizing um, UMA to um, uh, direct warnings uh, and using sound steering, which is a technology that we have to be able to direct sound at, you know, pedestrians specifically, and then also give them other warnings to uh, minimize the opportunity for impacts and also helping to protect those around the vehicle. Um, when we talk about ordering and configuring, this is where we look at the, the vehicle as a, you know, an overall ecosystem. So the UMA application, we, we created an application that will allow you to be able to, um, through, through the cloud, be able to tailor the vehicle for your needs and also be able to choose your own experience. So it's pretty cool. 
uh, idea. Um, recognition and greeting and boarding. Um, you know, when Uma comes to meet you, um, it will actually project uh, an image on the vehicle uh, to be able to give you a recognizable icon so that you know it's your vehicle. Uh, it will also uh, instruct the users on you know how to get in the vehicle or where to get in the vehicle or when the vehicle's ready uh, with a series of chimes and cues and you know even the fact that it opens the door but the idea is that you know we're making the experience very um, inviting and feel, feel very bespoke right very custom very personalized um, and then if we look at the interior there's no real steering wheel and we call this Hi, um, let's start uh, a new interior journey. sort of persona or the, I guess the premise behind it, 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 the idea is that it, we call it emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the core of the vehicle interaction. And um, we wanted it to feel soulful. We wanted it to feel like it's, you know, it's, it's natural. And um, we, we want the, the vehicle to feel more like a, a friend or a, you know, a, a buddy than, than uh, a, a car. So um, looking at the, the, the overall experience, we even thought about like ideas around seats. And again, these are all just concepts. Um, this, is, this is kind of a, a, what I'm doing is I'm trying to share with you guys like how we think in our studios and how we come up with ideas. And some of these ideas might be great ideas. Others might not be so great or they might not be for this application, but it, it kind of helps you to understand like how we visualize, how we come up with ideas and how we do this UX storytelling to create new things that help to uh, move the needle and that, that move uh, uh, experience and that, that, that change the future, right? Um, so when we think about the future experiences, uh, we, so we started with four different pillars, individualized, intuitive, immersive, and intelligent. And um, this kind of shows you overall, like when you get picked up by an UMA, um, it can give you a number of different things. So it can tell you, you know, um, you know, restaurants, you know, what, what's available, it'll allow you to be able to bookmark or save those things. Or, um, you know, maybe you're in the mood where you don't really care about all that stuff and you really just want to connect with, you know, your, your, one of your friends. Um, it allows you to be able to con connect with others, uh, you know, on your journey. Or um, maybe you just like, you know, want to be entertained. And so it allow you to do that where, you know, it becomes this immersive environment for um, creating like almost this like theatrical uh, experience. And one of the cool things about what we do is um, we specialize in audio. So um, we have a number of technologies that can help to create this more immersive um, environment with very small package uh, speakers. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, or maybe you just want to just zone out and be, sort of, uh, you know, chill and, and, you know, during the ride, uh, Uma can also accommodate that. So this is just taking you through different scenes or different scenarios, you know, based on, you know, what your preference might be as a user. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I know probably everyone's like, okay, well, that's, that's cool, but, you know, would any of that work, right? Well, the cool thing is that we have really smart people that do user testing in our team. And they actually ran sort of uh, low fidelity simulations of a lot of these scenarios to be able to validate and to be able to help us to hone some of these things in. So the, I, I guess the question is, it's not out of the realm of possibility that some of these things are working. I mean, there's still regulations and there's still, you know, technology barriers for some things, but the idea is that, you know, we create these things that we get where we use design and we use design thinking to push the envelope and push engineering uh, to, to, to do uh, new things. So uh, functional details, this just gives you an idea of like the size of the vehicle. So if you're wondering like how big this thing is, um, it's, it's very short, but it's, it's, it's relatively, um, tall, so you can almost uh, stand up um, next to it and barely see over the top of it. I could probably fit in it without standing up because <laughs> I'm not super tall. Um, and then we even talked about ideas for partners integration like DHL or, you know, Airbnb. Um, and then, you know, things like, you know, taking care of your luggage and uh, package delivery, et cetera.
and this just gives you some other ideas. But um, I wanted to go to the uh, question and answer section because I, I, I'm sure that I've done a lot to create questions and now I feel like I owe you guys some answers. So. <laughs> Very cool, thank you, Royce. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we'll get started with, we actually have a, uh, a comment, not so much a question, that uh, Uma's design makes me think of the cars in Westworld season three. Uh, it's very <laughs> cool. Something like that has been envisioned to become potential reality. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. The, the funny thing about Uma, Uma, this design, we did it like two years ago. And I think probably just shortly after that canoe came out and we were like, wow, a lot of the stuff or a lot of the thoughts that we had were um, executed by canoe. Um, so it's, 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 it's pretty cool. Um, I see someone out asking, uh, what 3D software do we use? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of the team uses Rhino. Um, my my product design team uses SolidWorks. Um, we have some people that use NX. Some people that use Alias. My background, I use Alias. Um, and then as far as rent rendering, um, we use Keyshot, and we use um, what's the? It used to be called Bone Speed. Uh, oh yeah. Um, showcase. Showcase. Yep. Showcase. Yeah, and then um, th those renderings that were there, they were just like from the, the ID team. So um, we have other teams that use like even like Mental Ray and like even more intense, you know, rendering software. But this was just like a, an industrial design internal, you know, sort of presentation that kind of um, we ended up sharing with, uh, with the world. But this is, a, I guess, the way that we communicate as designers to be able to kind of showcase some of the ideas. Uh, I think you actually also just sort of answered the second question in that realm was uh, if if the students were to get into that field, what were some of the programs that they should know? And I think you just kind of covered that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a question of how has a uh, pandemic uh, affected this design? And if so, how? Um, so this design was was already launched before the pandemic. One of the things that um, we talked about, though, is, or that we probably would talk about, is um, sort of UVC light uh, to be able to clean the cabin after um, people are in and out. Um, we could also use sort of a negative, you know, sort of air, you know, so to be able to suck, you know, and, and replenish the, the cabin air prior to um, using it, uh, another occupant using it. Um, so there, there are definitely some uh, things that we could do to address, um, you know, concerns, you know, around COVID. Um, and I guess, I guess to that point too, I, I think you guys are all experiencing sort of um, a different way of learning. I, I've got uh, um, like my team and I, we are, we're always on what we, it's WebEx and then we use like Teams for chat. And um, I feel like at first it was kind of hard but now I feel like we communicate better. And so it just, I think it also just shows like how adaptive um, designers are and how quickly we can come up to speed and, and, and use new tools and new ways to be able to uh, continue to um, innovate and continue to work together. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. How, how do you get funding for a project like this? And um, uh, will it take a while to generate income with this type of a project? So, so these these projects or this project in particular is what we call FX, our future experience. So we have money set aside within um, Human uh, to 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 develop these um, future experience concepts. So they're really small teams, and what they do is they're just like literally like it's designer. One of the designers that worked on this is from my my specific team, and he went into FX to work on this and, and, and uh, I, I kind of helped to start working on it um, with a couple other other designers from my team. But the thing is, it, it's, it's almost like a rotation, right? So we want the designers to stay fresh and to, you know, not get like sort of like uh, bored by working in like sort of <laughs> production stuff. So it's just a way of like 
it, it's almost like a design vacation to be able to free your mind and be able to think of new things. Um, the, the one thing that, that happens a lot of times when you work on a company and you work on consumer products is that you tend to like try to design the same thing over and over again and just sort of incrementally make it better. And this helps us to be able to break, you know, you know, sort of those, those uh, bad habits and uh, helping us to be able to think about things in a different way. So when we design the next thing that we were going to design, we, we definitely probably won't be able to do everything that you see here, but um, it'll help us, you know, there'll just be one or two ideas that'll make it into, you know, the, the new thing that we are, we are working on. So this is more of an internal visioning and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a competition style uh, yeah. project, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So what it is, it's, it's like, um, we call it UX storytelling. So user experience storytelling. And the idea is just to create these vision, you know, like it's almost like a mood board, but it's like a visual, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, storytelling mood board to be able to help to get everyone sort of on the same page as far as like what the future could hold so that they're not just thinking about, oh, well, let's just make it the same. Let's make it uh, a car that drives, but it, it looks just like the car that you currently drive today. And, you know, it, it, it you know, the, they, they just don't, it, it helps us to be able to control the narrative for what's going to happen in the future versus sort of just, you know, accepting and, and it being a technology first solution for being. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a kind of a follow up to that. That is uh, 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 canoe is another uh, version that came out with this kind of autonomous idea of interconnected. Um, how long do you think before an idea like this, a uh, working model of something like this can come out? Um, Even if it's know, not this exactly, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So I guess the, I guess the disclaimer uh, is, you know, for, for human, we don't actually produce the car. So this might be a client that we, that, that, that might like some ideas and, you know, they might implement this, you know, in their next generation vehicle. So um, I, I guess, the whole point for us doing these things, it's just more of uh, design thinking. It's more like a um, sort of thought leadership and kind of putting it out there. Um, we're not actually um, implementing this specific concept in any, any way. So we're not actually producing a car. It's more of a, just a concept to be able to um, help to provoke thinking for uh, future vehicles. So, yeah. so this is more likely a generation or two ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. This this vehicle is yeah. Um, the FX team is like five to ten years out in terms of what they produce. So yeah, so they're they're a little bit out there. There's a lot of technical uh, things that need to be solved, and then also you know it, it would be you know a client. So it might be a, a car company that would would do it, or it might be an electronics company that wants to get into cars. Who knows? <laughs> um, tailing off of that, where would you see? Um, uh, there there were several different areas commercially and residentially. Um, but if a technology like this were to become mainstream, where do you see it making the largest impact? You know, I, I think it makes the most sense in large cities, right? And um, I was supposed to travel just before COVID to the UAE, so the Emirates, um, for a, uh, or actually it was the KSA, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, for a city that they're building called, um, it's the city of 2030 and it's called Neom, N-E-O-M. And when I first saw this thing, I was like, no way, this is real. But what it is, is they're building the city, city of 2030. It's gonna be the most technologically advanced city in the world. It's gonna be the highest tech. It's gonna lead in everything from healthcare to, um, you know, vehicle, you know, clean energy to, to everything. So, um, you know, a place like that, a place, that's kind of starting from scratch would definitely be a place where I'd expect to see these types of ideas implemented, but also like large, you know, fast growing urban, you know, cities like, um, like I always bring up um, Shenzhen, but Shenzhen is an amazing city in my opinion, because it seems like every time I go there, there's like a whole new section of like skyscrapers and buildings. It's like when I first uh, went to China, I, 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 I was, you know, really blown away by the scale and the speed at which they do things there. And I feel like maybe that area of the world would probably be um, also like probably a good candidate for, you know, this type of transportation. Uh, great, yeah, I, I would uh, highly agree at that, an area like that where 
technology is not a an evolution it's part of their growth right right yeah um with design like this uh coming out on the market do you think scooters like bird and lime will go out of business or would you encourage those kinds of companies to um uh let's see uh to also design something um and they're saying being a competitor but obviously you guys are putting this out there as a vision for An others idea. anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think something like a Lyft or a um, Lyft or Uber or someone like a Bird and Lime, like that's a collaborative type thing that could take this type of technology yeah, you know, forward? Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, and this is just purely my my opinion, but I feel like, you know, those companies could be either, you know, they could come together to create something like this because Uber already has, you know, an app for the vehicle and they already have the scooters, right? Um, so they could create something seamless like this um, or it could be, you know, a, a new, uh, a whole new sort of player in that, that field. Um, so I, I think it's, again, it's, I, I don't necessarily know who's going to do what, but um I feel that you know something like this would definitely be successful, and I, and like I said, it's 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 not just because um, it's because of experience, right? So it's it's like experience is the thing that drives sort of people to move to different platforms over the other one, and I feel like whoever creates that most seamless experience is the one that's best positioned to win and to uh, become sort of the leader in the future. Uh, definitely. Um, uh, we've got a question. What is your opinion on Tesla's future and their drive to full autonomy? No pun intended. <laughs> I like Tesla. I have a lot of their stock. Um, <laughs> Good for you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think they're doing amazing things. I think they're um, definitely um, leading, you know, the charge or they've led and they were kind of pioneers uh, in, in a lot of things they're doing. But um, I think also um, a lot of other companies are, you know, really paying attention and they're starting to emulate and trying to figure out, you know, that next move. Um, so I think that the future is going to be very exciting when it comes to that. And, um, you know, I, I just say, you know, strap, strap in and hold on, man, because I mean, I, I think Elon Musk is definitely doing some really cool stuff and, uh, you know, like I said, like I just saw the the new vehicle that GM did, that new hum, Hummer, which was pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, like if you go to China, there's so many different <laughs> EV companies. So, you know, it's definitely going to be an exciting time. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it's a lot going forward at this point. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, how environmentally friendly is a design like this when you're uh, obviously, it's at the vision end, but when you're thinking about um, how things could be manufactured or its end of life, uh, do you guys look at that sort of stuff when you're visioning, or is that more of the back end of the design? Well, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. So one of the things that, that we do is, um, even our studios today, what we're looking at is sort of, you know, end of life design for disassembly because, um, you know, the, the environment is important and everything that we build, you know, it ends up becoming junk one day, right? No, no matter how beautiful the sketch was or no, how, no matter how you know, cool the product is, eventually it has an end of life. So, you know, thinking about how we can make products um, make their way better into sort of reuse and recyclability is definitely one of the things that we like to focus on as, as designers. And um, I feel like uh, with a vehicle like this, there's definitely uh, a place for that, especially considering that it's a uh, um, uh, uh, all electric vehicle, um, weight is gonna be important. So also thinking about like the types of materials, the types of panels that you, that you use and um, definitely, I feel like the future um, designers um, that, you know, of the past, the way that we design things in the past is definitely changing, you know, as we move ahead in the future and realize, you know, how much of an impact the stuff that we produce makes on the world. Um, we've got a question here that I think uh, you and I will probably take personally as kind of car fans ourselves is um, many, and you were kind of alluded to this in the beginning of your presentation is many people see cars 
uh, uh, what the car they own as an extension of their personality. Uh, do you think that would be lost if no one owned cars and uh, on demand, uh, everything were on demand service? Do you see that as uh, actually happening? So, do you see it yeah, as yeah. taking over for part? Where, where, where do you see the vision for that for us car lovers? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like there's a place for both. Um, cause I definitely, when I go out of the country, I go to a new city. I, I, even as much as I love cars, I don't miss it. Like, it's like, if I go to a restaurant and I'm in New York and then I go to a bar, I don't miss not having to jump in a car or have to call Uber. It's like, I, I like having the, you know, the option of not having to drive and be able to live and experience things without having to worry about, you know, going four blocks back and two blocks over to find my car. So um, I think that um, definitely there's a place where cars um, and, and this type of like autonomy will will make sense. But then there's other areas like if I'm like on PCH or I'm, I'm in California right now, by the way, <laughs> um, uh, if I'm on PCH and, and, and I'm driving, I, and I hit a nice, you know, Angeles Crest, you know, like curvy road. Uh, you know, that's where I wanted to drive, right? And, you know, if, if there's a, a vehicle, um, you know, sort of, you know, the, the ability to be able to have both of those experiences, not necessarily even the same vehicle, but I feel like just like there's, there's shoes, you've got some shoes that you use for, you know, dressing up, you got flip flops that you use at the beach, and you got, you know, running shoes when you want to go running, you know, that I feel like there's going to still be a place for all those things. So I, I don't think it'll, I don't think it will go away. I think it will definitely still exist, but um, it, I, I feel like uh, there's just going to be certain people that <laughs> that buy those, right? Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way as that personal cars won't necessarily go away, but they won't have to be a mandatory for people that don't need them in their daily life you know, where they, right, right. they actually gonna, probably become more valuable and special. Yeah, I'm going to take it real old school. So um, when I grew up, I had to learn how to drive on a manual transmission. My dad lives in New Orleans, and I had to learn how to drive on, um, not Bourbon Street, but Canal Street, uh, how to drive a manual. That was when I had my Opal. And um, <laughs> it, it was like one of the really hard things to do. But after that, I was like, okay, I'll never drive another car unless it's a manual. And then, you know, as time went on, manuals became more and more scarce. So then I ended up buying a car that has uh, automatic transmission. And now, you know, the new cars with DSG and, you know, some of the like, you know, transmissions that are, you know, like Steptronic or whatever, they're, they're faster than shifting manually. So it's like, you know, I, I feel like, you know, the nostalgia in me wants to always shift manually. But then now that I know that I can use like paddles and stuff that, are much faster when I want to shift. I feel like that's like <laughs> kind of the similar thing, right? You adapt. Yeah, I think we've all uh, ad adapted in a sense. I went from always having manuals to now I have a Jeep Wrangler that has a an automatic transmission because it spends most of its time on the highway. Right, um, right, exactly. And yeah. ac actually, the automatic transmission in the newer Jeeps have better for descent. So it's actually a, a better rock climbing or rock crawling experience uh, and less right, running right. out of a clutch. Um, <laughs> I, I, th I think if I had an older Jeep that was just for um, strictly playing around in, I would go manual, but driving on the 405, there is no way. Um, yeah, yeah. We have a question about what is your opinion on the Airbus drone? Uh, are you familiar with what are your thoughts on it oh yeah yeah the airbus yeah yeah that that's it's cool i, I mean I, I don't know if i know the airbus one specifically but those like e evitols um i think those are a really cool idea um like sometimes i wish that i had one now that, that i could hop into to get from point a to point b especially if you're in like like again like new york or some big city and you're like you know, I have to get to the airport and it's like, I've only got like an hour and it's going to take me like two hours to get there. So I already know I'm going to miss my flight. So it's, it's, it's like, you know, those things make so much sense in spaces like that, especially even like if you have an option to use it as like a ride share and like, I would pay a premium just to get to where I need to get to just because 
you know, it's, it, it's, again, it's, it's like, if I need it, then I need it. Right. It's not like something I ride in every day, but the, you know, expanding the options. Right. I think that's pretty cool. Um, oh, we have a question uh, about the, uh, what's your take on the 2021 Ford Bronco? Uh, I just, there is a manual. Ordered you ordered one. I ordered one. Yeah. What package? Wild track. Oh, I think it's called Wild Track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, currently, I drive a BMW M40 or X3 M40i. So it's a, it's, it's a. They're all gas guzzlers, but. <laughs> yeah. I like. Uh, very cool. Cars. Very cool. I all like right. Right now. Uh, so, somebody said, uh, and missed the marketing opportunity for the Bronco, killing the competition. I'm. Not sure what you mean by that. Uh, so we'll. Uh, <laughs> um, any any other thoughts we got here for uh, for Royce before he goes? <clears throat> no. I do like Jeep too, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're fun. The uh, I, it, it's kind of interesting how they have kind of become like the nine eleven of constant evolution, and whereas you know. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of the competition has gone forward and back, forward and back, and forward and back, and Jeep has just done this constant slow evolution. Um, yeah. What do you guys think of the new Grand Wagoneer? I mean, that thing is is pretty intense. So a friend of mine worked on that Dwayne Jackson, and uh, um, it's pretty it's pretty interesting. It's it's nice to see. I felt like always felt like Jeep had the opportunity to go more upscale in terms of you know, their brand. Cause it's, it's like, they're one of those brands that like, you could be like super rich and drive a Jeep, or you could just be like somebody that like, I got a Jeep, you know, I got a car, I got a Jeep, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, right. both ends of the spectrum. And it's like, kind of like this very sort of, um, I feel like it's, it's, it's a, a very, uh, I'm going to use the word democratic, right? It's like a, everybody you know, can, can, can have this, right. It's like a, it's almost like Volkswagen, right. The people's car. Right? Yeah, I, th I think they, uh, personally, I think they got a little off um, uh, gun shy maybe with the Commander because that was kind of their step into the big luxury vehicles away yeah. from the Grand Cherokee. And it didn't do as as well as they thought it would. And so they just kept everything down at the Grand Cherokee level for a long time. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so. this new one. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive, though. Yeah, it'll be interesting cool. to um, see because that's a uh, uh, that it's definitely pushing the upper boundaries of what most people think of as a uh, a Jeep. Right, right, and I, to me, that's one of my favorite things is to see brands do that. Right, like really test the limits. Right, it's like it's it's just you know whether it works or not. It, it, that's that's one thing, but I, it, it's like you gotta commend them for at least taking the chance right and i feel like uh there's people that that are probably looking for that vehicle and if you look at the the, the craftsmanship that's been put into it and the thought and the de details i feel like people you know will appreciate that so um we have a question of uh so i think you already answered but maybe you can clarify what was your first car and your all-time favorite car okay so so yeah my first car was um a 1973 Opal GT, and then I had three of those. Those had crank, crank headlights, correct? To yeah, the, the headlights was four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was that was I think one of my first cars. Um, as far as my favorite car, um, you know, right now, I don't know. I, I, I I like so many cars for different. I had a Mini Cooper, which I thought was really fun and really cool. Um, I have, like I said, my BMW now. Um, I I have uh, like I want a I wanted a McCann, but like I like the Taycan Taycan Taycan. I can't oh, even say the yeah. name Taycan. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, I think it's cool. So. Yeah, those uh, they're I think they're now actually outselling every car that they sell combined just strange yeah, yeah. I, I think another car that i, I want um is uh and I, I don't necessarily like the looks of it just because i heard it and it sounded amazing 
was the new Lamborghini Urus, which I don't think it's a beautiful vehicle at all. It's more of a, just the bruteness of the vehicle and the sound of it. But uh, um, I also like uh, the new Tesla Cybertruck. I think that's pretty cool. Like I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a that's a pretty cool vehicle. I have to definitely see that uh, once it, it comes out. Um, but yeah, it'll be I, interesting I just, I like, to see what they do with that in a yeah. real world setting. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't a fan of it at first, but then it's one of those things that, that again, it's like I I recognize that they took a real chance. They did something different, and they broke the mold in terms of like what a truck should look like. And I respect that. And, you know, whether I love the design or not, I, I think it's more, I, I respect it. Right. And I, that, that's the reason why I like it. So. Um, I, so I actually kind of have a question for you. That's non automotive related. Cause we could talk about cars all night long. <laughs> I have a feeling um, is when you start to, as a, uh, as a studio, go after these projects like Uma and uh, you're developing the prompt. Is that an internal prompt? Does it come from any sort of external like um, formulation or is it something that's like everybody throws out ideas and you figure out what's what's the best idea for us to put this effort on or how do you guys yeah. approach it to put it that way so so one of the things we do is we look at like um sort of trends right and so we do like a um sort of like looking at trends look at what's happening in the world and we essentially it's like it's like i'm bob ross but except for i have no hair it's like i'm painting a picture and it's like you know we we start with sort of these these ideas of like you know sort of these bleeding edge and leading edge technologies and social and economic and environmental trends. And we kind of laid that all out. And then we start to say, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if this, this, so it's, it's almost like we're just literally playing, right? We're playing, but then we actually start to put together things and, and we start to analyze them and uh, start to realize, hey, this is probably stuff that's going to happen. Or if this happens and this happens, then this is probably what would, you know, what would result, you know? So it's, it's almost like a um, mental exercise. It's, it's, it's like just playing, uh, like uh, playing a game almost, right? But at the same time, it's like, uh, these are things that probably um, will or could happen. And um, we, it gets our designers, you know, starting to think about like solutions um, in those spaces. And then also then it helps them to think about the stuff that they're designing for today in a different light, because now you start to create this vision right out here that says, okay, this is the future. This is what the future is going to be. And then you can start to say, okay, well, if that's the future, then these are the things that I need to do along the way to get to that, you know, that ideal sort of vision of the future. So it's almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy you know, um, but it, it's, it's a way of us, you know, putting these markers out and saying, okay, well, if that, if that's going to be the future and, and then all of a sudden now we show this to uh, the world or we show it to, you know, some of our clients, they definitely might be interested in some of these ideas and that can lead to us being able to help to influence the future. So we by no means actually create the vehicles, but we definitely have um, ideas that, that can definitely be used by others to, to, to create that future. And we can be a part of helping to bring those to life. Um, are there any other, uh, so this is obviously a big touch on mobility and um, how interconnected it can be with both technology and uh, that sort of thing. What other areas um, have you guys focused with these kinds of efforts? Uh, what other parts of life have you touched on? Yeah, so we just recently um, did one and it relates more to fashion um, and looking at fashion and how um, design and technology can have an effect on that um, and even on brands, right? And how brands implement their um, uh, mark on fashion, right? So um, interesting uh, topic. Um, that was one. Um, we, we, we play in so many different spaces, air, air, air travel, um, uh, COVID, you know, like situations, right? You know, what happens if people now are, they don't want to go back to sort of sharing rides and, 
you know, being together? What if people enjoy being in, you know, sort of their own little space, right? Which I don't think is going to be the case. I think people will be aware of, you know, things, but I, even if you look at today uh, and, you know, just people want to be around people, right? That's just, we're, we're wired that way, you know, so. Great. Yeah. Um, I, I think this has been a really large experiment and we, some good things have definitely come out of this that we're, yeah. there's much less assumptions around what work can be done remotely and what can't. Um, yeah. But I, but I think there's also a test of who we are as humans in general and what we need. Um, yeah. So. Very cool. Well, uh, Royce, thank you so incredibly much for joining us tonight. 